In this module, we're going to focus on building reusable templates. So this is where we take the skills that you've learned in this course and we start to actually build them together to build something that we can actually use over and over again. What we're going to start with is we're going to look at the best practices for data inputs. I'm going to show you some tips and techniques in order to make sure that we can actually rely on the data that ends up in the spreadsheets that we've built. I'm also going to show you how to create some good data validation options. This is going to prevent garbage from getting into the spreadsheets that you've built. And I'll show you how to use styles to quickly make changes if something should need to be modified or updated in a hurry. We'll also talk about protection options, how to actually go about protecting the work and what different options do we have in order to make the workbook actually even more efficient by using these. Last for Excel, what we're going to do is we're going to look at turning our workbooks into templates. And this is where we can take some of the forms that we've built and actually repurpose them so that they can be reused over and over and over again, turning our hard work into an investment. And then finally, we'll actually go and we'll build a mail merge template that we can use to actually send out things like dunning letters and, and other uh, tasks as well. So we'll look at all of those in the course of this next module. One of the things that I like to do with Excel is build templates for other people to use. I'll do the architecture and let them actually fill in and use these things on a regular basis. And when I'm doing that, there are some best practices rules that I will follow for the data inputs in order to make sure that I get good data into my spreadsheet solution. Why? Well, because there's some challenges around data inputs, and this has actually been studied that for simple data entry, users make errors about once in every 200 cells. And if users are actually writing formulas, that error rate can jump as high as one in every 20 cells. So for this reason, I've got some rules that I follow when I'm designing these spreadsheets to try and minimize that risk of error. I try and make it as easy as possible for the user to put things in and try and reduce the chance that they can actually cause problems. The first rule is called the single input paradigm. This is where we enter data once and once only into the spreadsheet and we make use of all of the different formulas that we have at our disposal to actually extract the different formats of the data that we need. The more you input, the more likely to make a mistake, so why not put in a single cell and split it apart using your formulas? That reduces the chance of getting garbage out. If you actually take a look here at the example down the bottom, you'll notice that we have a report date, which is July 15th, 2015. Now, when I first started working at one of the companies I was at, we actually had a layout where people were required to manually, for every day's sales reports, enter all of these cells. And I changed this in a real hurry because the reality was that they'd come back from being on a weekend and they might forget to change the day or they might forget to change the day in long form. They're working with historical data. They're on Monday morning. They're trying to process Fridays or Saturdays or Sundays and they, they just don't always get it all right. So why make them do it? Why not put in the date once and then use the month formula to extract the month number and the year formula to extract the year, the day, and even the text formula to extract the weekday's name. We have a huge battery of formulas that we can use. We should make use of them because that way the user only has to enter one piece in and it'll validate through all the rest. So that's the first rule. The second rule we look at is identifying our input cells. What you'll see is if you look at this little table down the bottom here, it has a bunch of green cells. I tell every user that works on my spreadsheets, green means go. These are the cells where you are supposed to put in your data. If it's white, it has a formula in it, and we don't want that overwritten. Over here, this is a simple input. Now, I actually have two different color schemes that I go with. I'll use green for everyday inputs. I also use a light blue for sometimes inputs. And this works really well for things that you will need to change, but you don't need to change all the time. Things like tax rates, maybe GST or HST rates that tend to go up or down. It only happens once every two or three years, but we still want to know where in the spreadsheet we would make that change. The year field, we're gonna change that once a year, but it's still a good idea to know where that's gonna be done. So the nice thing about this is that when you actually get into this habit, you put spreadsheets out in front of your team and everything's highlighted with this consistent styling to say, hey, put your data into your green cells. Somebody can open up the worksheet and it's immediately self-documenting. They know exactly where to go and where to put their data in. And more importantly, they know which cells not to overwrite and destroy, which is really important. So this is rule number two, is to clearly identify your input cells 
pick a standard color. It doesn't have to be green, but I do recommend something that's soft. You don't want to go with a nuclear yellow because that's going to drive people crazy. But a nice soft background color that you can identify and give people a rule is really going to help make sure that you get your data put into the right place and it will stop compromising the integrity of the files from people overwriting formulas. The third rule is use explicit inputs. And to explain this one, what I really want to show you is this formula right here. So this is generating some compound interest on our balance to show what somebody's going to be paying at the end of X periods. The problem is, is that if somebody wants to update this, they now need to go in and they need to actually modify the hard coded numbers that are in here. What happens when the interest rate changes to 7% or when the debt changes to 15,000 as the starting portion? That's going to be problematic. And especially think about this. What happens if you give this file to somebody else and you go on vacation and you need them to maintain it? Do you really want them editing these formulas? So this rule is to use explicit inputs where we actually break the components down into individual cells. Here's our principal, our interest and our periods. And then we use a formula using our cell references to actually pick up all those individual pieces. This helps with a few different things. It helps make the formula immediately more auditable. It helps make it more updatable and it helps make it self-documenting. And this is huge because it means that somebody else can use the spreadsheet that you built. So that's our third rule. Use explicit inputs. Don't hard code values into your formula unless they'll never change. I think what you'll find is if you follow those three rules when you're building your spreadsheets, it'll make it very easy for you to actually take those and delegate them to somebody else when you either get promoted or go on vacation. For this example, I'm building a small to medium enterprise credit scoring facility. And you'll notice that just by looking at it, you can see that I've already started following the rules that I had in our last segment in order to try and encourage people to put in valid data. We've got nice cells highlighted in green. It's self-documenting and that's great. But the challenge is, is that people can still put in the wrong information. Now we have two ways of validating data in Excel. We've got reactive data validation. That's where we let somebody enter something and use a conditional format to highlight it if it's outside of our range. But what we would prefer to do is actually use proactive data validation where we prevent somebody from putting something into the model that shouldn't be there. And for that reason, we've got this cool feature in Excel under the data tab called data validation. What I'm going to do now is set up a rule to prevent somebody from putting in a date that is outside of the last two weeks. So it's either up to from two weeks ago to today's date. Those are the only valid entries that I want in here. So I'm going to go to data validation and I'm going to set up a rule to do this. Notice by default, every cell in Excel will allow any value, but I can change this to say, I want a date. And I can even set up a lot of different ways, greater than, less than, all kinds of things. But for me right now, between is perfect. And what I'd like to do is be between today's date minus 14 days, and the maximum is gonna to be today's date. So we'll just use the today function here. I can now say, okay, and what you'll see is that if somebody were to go and try and type in a date of something like, I don't know, 2018-01-01, it's going to come back and tell me that it doesn't meet the data validation restrictions defined for the cell. But if I go and throw in today's date, it allows it in quite nicely. The challenge here is that the message that we get when we try and put something in, it's not really ideal. It just tells me that it's invalid data and I'd like to customize that. And that's something that we can also do through our data validation rule. I can go to my error alert tab and say, hey, this is an invalid date. Please enter a date within the last two weeks. And there we go, we'll say okay. And now when somebody goes to try and put in that date from January 1st, it comes back and uses my header and my text for my data validation message, which is excellent. For our company name, obviously validating to dates is not gonna work. So let's go and try this one. We'll go to data validation. We'll go back to settings. And this time, what can we use? Whole numbers, decimals, lists, those don't look like they'll work, but text length, that's a good choice. Let's say that we want a text length to be greater than one character. And we'll say 
Okay. So now, if somebody tries to put in something that is one character long, they just put in C, it will come back and say that it doesn't meet the data validation restrictions. Let's go customize that error message as well. We'll come back and say, invalid entry, please enter the full company name. Now, I can only validate at this point to say if it's greater than two characters. So if a company name was just CO, that will work, but at least it gives you the ability to start playing around and trying to force certain things to happen. You just have to be a little careful with what the boundaries of that company name might be and how many characters for your minimums. But you'll see that there's also other ways to look at that as well. Let's look at age. For age, we'll also put a restriction on. Our normal setup for age is to go and allow a whole number of an age between 19 and 90 years old. Outside those boundaries, we start to get a little bit concerned. So we'll say okay. And at this point, if somebody enters 19, it'll work. If they enter 17 though, it comes back with an error. But what if we do have a really enterprising 17 year old and we do want to extend credit? Well, this would be better to warn somebody about this that it's outside the normal range and maybe let them put it in. And we can do that with the data validation rule as well. So we'll go to our error alert tab and we're gonna change the stop message to be a warning. So in this case here, we'll say, are you sure this age appears to be outside our normal range of 19 to 90? The difference with this error message is that this one allows you to actually say, would you like to continue anyway? Yes, I would. And it will still actually let you put it in, which is kind of nice. Now, next up, let's look at our education for a postgraduate. This is going to be one of the valid entries from here. And there happens to be a data validation rule here that allows us to pick a value from a list. And for this list, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, it's in these cells right here. And I'm going to put in an error alert that says invalid choice, please enter an item from the list. And now you'll see you get a little drop down here and it allows you to pick these items right off of the actual list itself. But one of the things I do want you to notice from our data validation rule when we set this up is that this uses an absolute reference. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just take these values and define a name over top of them and point to that name instead. And that way, if we add new items, it should pick them up. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Up in the name box here, we'll type in DVAL and we'll use education as a name. And now I'm going to go back and modify this rule to say equals DVAL education as a name. You'll notice it still works. And now if I go and enter another entry, it will also pick that off the list as well, which is pretty cool. The final thing I want to show you here with data validation rules is how to work with decimals. And the reason being is because decimals can actually work a little bit differently than some of the other rules. You can't use whole number. In order to have a fractional decimal or fractional number, you need to have a decimal rule set up. And in this case, what I'm going to do is set up a rule that starts at zero and I'm going to go to a maximum of two, which would be 200%. So when I start looking at my table of validation ratios, this will actually feed within that area. I can now go in and put in 117.8, but I can't put in 201% because that falls outside the boundaries of the actual rule itself. Now let's go look at form controls as an alternate to data validation. In order to use your form controls, you're going to need to have the developer tab showing. And if you don't, it's easy to get. We can right click, we can say customize the ribbon, and then you check the box next to developer. And that will bring up this tab, which happens to hold all of our form controls under the insert option here. What I'm going to start with is I'm going to choose this one here, which is the combo box. So I'm going to click on it. I'm going to come back to my worksheet. I'm going to left click and drag and you'll see that it will drop this cool looking control on here. I'm going to right click on it, go to format control, and it's going to ask me for a few things. It's going to ask me for an input range. I'll say, you know what, let's grab these three items right here. 
and then it asks me for a cell link, which I'm going to drop into the blue cell. I can say OK, and at this point, I'm going to click outside the control to get it out of design mode. And now if I click the drop down box, you can see that I can pick off something like ordinary. The result that this returns is two. Now what this is doing is it's actually picking up the index number of the value from the list. So ordinary was the second item in the list and new is the third item. So how do we actually take this and get the proper piece back? We use the index function. The index function, we'll go with index, we'll pick up our original array of values, and then it wants to know which row would you like to pick back from the list? We say, well, I wanna pick this one. And which column? I've only got one column that I've selected here, so one column would be fine. I can close my parenthesis and hit enter. You can see now that when we actually work with this, it looks good. And here's the cool thing. If I right click on this, this puts it in design mode. What I can do is I can actually expand this so you never really even need to see the column that's driving this or the cell that's driving it. Let's look at another. This one's gonna be the list box. We'll go to insert and we're gonna pick this guy here is our list box control. We'll go left click and drag. We'll put him down all the way over here. Right click, format control, and this time we'll choose our input range as our education levels. The cell link will be our blue cell. We'll hit OK, and it gives us our list. If I now go and click on secondary, it'll pick up number three. And how do I actually go and pull this back? Well, once again, we use the index function. We index our list, comma, which row would we like to pick back, comma, which column, and close. We've now got secondary. So I can go to university and so on. Now I'm gonna edit this again because I wanna show what happens when we actually go and shorten this down so we have less rows. You'll see that we get a scroll bar here that we can scroll up and down. So if you're space constrained, this will actually let you play around with this a little bit as well in order to get to the items that you want. The next control that I wanna work with here, the last one is the scroll bar. So we're gonna say insert, and this one you'll find right here, this is the scroll bar. I'm gonna go again and say left click and drag, and now I'm gonna right click and configure this one as well. Now this one's got a few more options. Current value, we're gonna to set to one. Minimum value, to one. The maximum value, I'm gonna count the values in my list here. I have five of them, so I'll use that. The incremental change I'll leave as one, and then I'm gonna set my page change to three. That's a whole lot of values. We'll now click cell link and drop it into the blue cell. And we'll say okay. At this point, the way the scroll bar works is when I index up by clicking the arrows, it goes up by one. So I can cycle all the way through. If I click in the main scroll bar area itself, it goes by three because that's the page change that I was working with. Well, what can I do with this guy? Same thing. I can now go and say index, well, index these guys here. I could even choose, for example, the score and say which row number, number five, which column this time, the second column. I want to bring back my score. I'll hit enter. So at this point, it comes back with a score of five. If I go and keep changing this backwards, you'll notice that the first item, which is postgraduate, gives us a score of 10. So think about using a control like this to drive your postgraduate here. You could have a scroll bar right here that you link back and forth through. If we change the column to pick back one instead of the actual score, it would allow us to cycle through using a scroll bar our options for education from our table. The next thing I wanna show you is something called styles. And you would look at this and say, well, this sheet has some style that's got a lot of consistency, but the key with styles is actually enforcing consistency and also making it very easy to update later. To a different style. You'll notice that when I look at my header rows here, these all look somewhat similar. Now, there are built-in styles that I could have applied in order to make some of these work. Let's say that I wanted a heading style that looked like this, or orange, or blue. I could apply that and have it consistently go through the workbook, but this isn't really going to work for me. I want to build my own custom styles. I want something right now for my data entry text cells and nothing on this list really speaks to me. So I'm gonna to go to new cell style, and I'm gonna make one for DE underscore text, the DE standing for data entry. Once I'm here, you'll notice that it's already controlling my number format, the alignment is not being controlled because it's not checked, my font is set up, the fill, and protection. 
but I want to actually change something about this. I'm going to go to format and I'm going to change the fill to be a light yellow background for my data entry, because this is what my boss asked me to do. I can also change things on the alignment, the fonts, the borders, but for right now, the fill is the only thing I'm going to change and we'll say, okay. And it says, all right, you're going to have a shaded fill. And when we say, okay, you would expect that it would take place, but it doesn't. And this is a key thing is once you create your own new styles, they will still show up in the styles gallery, but you actually have to select them in order to make them work. And from here, I could then take this and now quickly apply it to the other places without having to go and set up all of the different fills or formats that I might want, because this will actually pick across all of the things I configured there, including the fonts, including the backgrounds, the borders and whatnot. Now you look at that and you go, okay, well, that's kind of cool and everything else, but I told you that my rule is green. And this is where styles become super useful and important because let's be honest, rolling this through and reapplying this stuff to all of your cells in your workbook can take a lot of time, but check this out. What happens when somebody comes back and says, you know, Ken, I've decided that I actually like your green rule. Let's right click and modify this one. We'll go back into format and we'll go to the fill tab and we'll choose light green. And now we'll say OK and OK, and it updates every cell that's based on that style in the entire workbook. So the redeployment is pretty nice here. Now, for reference, what I'll also do is I'll go through and I'll set up other styles for some different things. I'll have a data entry style for text. I'm going to create a new data entry style here as well for DE, and I'm going to say $0. This has got all kinds of things that are coming with it. I'm going to go in and make some formatting changes. We'll go to light green. I'm fine with the way the borders are set up, the fonts, the alignment, and the numbers. And this is why I chose dollar zero is because I forced this to zero decimal places. I can now say, okay, say, okay. And I can apply my dollar zero style to this guy here. And if I ever do need to make a change to it, it's now super easy to roll through the workbook. So this is where styles can really help us enforce both consistency and give us the ability to update quite easily in future. And it's something that I think is well worth the time if you're developing a model that somebody else is going to use. The next step that we want to do is we want to actually try and protect the workbook structure as much as we can. Think about when we go on vacation, we delegate the file to someone else. The last thing we want to do is come home and find out that all of our key formulas are overwritten. Now we've done everything we can here so far with setting up a style of sheet that's inviting to users to put in things in the right place. We've shaded the input cells, but everything is still pretty wide open. If somebody really was determined to, they could totally come over here and they could go and delete one of our key formulas. Well, that would be a bad thing. We'll just press control Z to bring that back. Now the challenge is, is that we need to find a way to lock this down, but here's the problem. If I go to review and I go to protect sheet, You'll notice I've got lots of options. Can they select lock cells, unlock cells? We've got a whole bunch of different things that we could do here. I'm going to protect this sheet right now with no password. And my intention here is really to basically say, I want to stop people from accidentally damaging it. If they need the ability to unlock the worksheet for any reason, say they're blocked out of something they need access to by not having a password that will let them get in and edit it. So here's the thing. Can they delete this formula now? Nope, they can't. That's perfect. But can they come over and put a new value into construction in progress? No, they cannot. So that's really not good. As a matter of fact, any of the green cells are locked out and won't let them access them. Well, why? Let's take a look at the properties of these cells. We'll go to format cells and you'll notice on the protection tab that the cell is locked, but it's always been locked. The spreadsheet's not protected. Why is it letting us in here? This particular page of the format cells dialog box only actually gets used when the worksheet is protected. By default, every cell in Excel is locked. And this is a good thing because you would not want to have to go through, protect your worksheet and then go through to find all the cells that should be protected. It should be completely the opposite. Everything's protected unless you explicitly say, yes, you can actually edit that. So this is good. The key though, we need to uncheck the locked box on this. So we'll say, okay, if we take a look at the most recent year end format cells, this one is also locked. We'll uncheck it and we'll say, okay, let's see if this makes a difference. We'll protect the sheet. We'll say, okay, 
and let's go and see if we can change this now to some other company and hit enter and it allows us to take place here we'll go in and we'll put in a different year end that works but if we go down to construction in progress of course we never made a change to this particular cell setup in order to actually make it work so we can toggle these values this is good we can obviously still protect our formulas but how do we actually roll it through the whole sheet well guess what we use styles i've taken the workbook i used in the last segment and i've actually gone to the liberty of adding a whole bunch of styles and if you look through the entire workbook now you'll see that all of these cells have been formatted there is three user data entry styles in here. There's a data entry zero, which will actually put in our data entry values for our dollar signs, data entry date, which formats this date cell, and data entry text, which is all over the place for our text-based cells. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna modify the DE dollar zero. Notice the protection status is locked. Even if it said unlocked or it wasn't checked, I highly recommend that you go into format and recommit it by changing the setting here. It's by clicking OK that these settings are reconfirmed back out the other side. So if you find it's not taking, make sure you go into format and say OK. We'll now go and do date, modify. It's locked. We'll go to format, unlock it, and say OK. Protection, no protection. That's good. Right click, modify. Protection is locked. We'll go to format unlock this and say OK and OK. Our system settings, if we take a look at percent two, is locked. That's good. And our system for zero is also locked. That's good. So now when we go up to our view tab and protect our worksheet and say OK, we can still modify our dates. We can also go and drop in a new balance into our system, but we can't delete the actual formula. So this is the best of both worlds, making use of styles to deploy these changes on a mass scale very quickly throughout the entire workbook. I'm really happy with this. I'm starting to feel pretty proud of this file here. This thing looks like something I could use every time I need to analyze somebody's balance sheet and income statement in order to assess their credit worthiness. So I'm thinking, boy, I'd really like to reuse this file. So on that basis, I've gone through and I've made a couple of changes over what you saw last time. The first one, I've wiped out all of the values. Now I've left the different account names because most of the time the income statements and balance sheets will have similar account names. So that just allows me to populate things a little quicker. But obviously the values need to be set to zero. When I did that, I realized I needed to make a little tweak to the formulas I'm using for my percentages as well because C44 was coming up zero, which was resulting in an ugly divide by zero error. So I've gone and tested to make sure if it is zero, we'll throw a zero in place, otherwise run the original calculation. And now my file looks beautiful and polished even when it's empty of data. And at this point, what would you do if you wanted to actually work with this over and over again? What most users would do is they would say, okay, I'll save a copy of this. I'll fill it in for my client. And then when I get a new client, I'll just do a save as and change all the information. Well, that obviously has some inherent dangers. What happens if you leave one of the lines in there when you're changing it from one person to another? That can obviously skew the ratings one way or another, and that would be a bad idea. The other thing is what happens if one of your formulas does get compromised? If you're in that habit of doing a save as and redeploying every time, you're going to carry that problem forward with you all the time, and that's a dangerous habit to be in. What will be much better is if we could actually draw a line in the sand and say, every time you're going to do one of these reports, I want you to go back to the original file and kick off a completely untainted copy and start from there so that we have one version we can maintain that's driving every new analysis. And that would be actually be really useful because then if there are any changes to the logic, we can roll them out if people are always going back to the original file. Well, that is the purpose of a template. So to create a template, what we're going to do is we'll set the file up exactly the way we want to. So we've cleared everything out, the sheets are protected, everything's good. And then we'll go and we'll select the cell that we want the user to be in when they open the file. We'll just save a backup copy of the file really quick. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go and do a save as. Now I happen to have the button on the QAT up here. If you don't, you just go through the file menu and do save as. 
this will kick off here for me into my default folder where I'm storing these things. What I'm going to do at this point in time is I'm going to go down to where it says Excel workbook.xlsx and I'm going to change this to Excel template.xltx. This will automatically change the directory to my custom office templates directory. And what I'm going to do now is give the file a name. I'm going to call it FS Analysis. And you'll notice that it saves it as FS Analysis XLTX. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go and say, let's go file and close. And now I want to kick off a new version from the template. So I'm going to say file, but instead of open, I'm going to go to new. And under new, you'll find personal. And when I click on that, it comes back and gives me the FS analysis file that I had before. So I'll just click on this once and it'll open it up. Now the key thing that I want you to recognize here is that the file name up the top here is called FS Analysis 1. And you'll notice that it doesn't end with a file extension in any way. So I could now go and fill out my credit application for some company. And when I've got everything in here and everything set up the way that I want, at that point, I'm going to save this. So I'll now go and say, I'll just click the save icon. And you'll notice that it pops me into the save as dialog. Now it's giving me an FS analysis one, it's giving me an Excel workbook. I'm going to go store this for right now, just on my desktop. And we'll call it FS analysis one. When I now go and say file close, I can obviously reopen this at any point in time by going back to file and you'll notice that it's actually on my recents list. There we go. Or of course I could browse for it. This will again open it up in edit mode so that I can edit the file and work with it as I need. So let's just circle back on this for a moment and really clarify this. We've taken a workbook that we want to deploy to our users. We save it as a template and then we teach them to use file new to pick off the template file. At that point, it creates a completely new copy without ever touching the underlying original file. When they hit save as, they can't overwrite our file. That's perfect. They just create a new copy. And they can open that as many times they want to update it or edit. But the question now is what happens when we need to update the template itself? Because if we kick off file new, it creates a new file. That's not really cool. Well, the answer is that we would actually go back to the file menu. And this time, we're going to go to open. And when we go into open, at that point in time, we can go and we can open our XLTX file. At this point, it'll open our template so that we can edit and make changes to the template. And then when we do a file save, it'll actually update the template with new changes. At that point, anybody that kicks off a new file from the template will get those new changes. However, be aware that any files that are already based on the template will not get those new changes because it's actually using the status of that file when you create the new file. The real question though, where do you find that file path to know where to open that template from? Well, you can find that under file, under options, and if you check the save options, you'll see that your file path is listed here under the default personal templates location. But what if you want to actually go bigger than this? What if you want to store all of your files in a network drive and you want the people in your credit department to also use those? You don't really want to have to save them into their own personal templates. That's not really easy to share. Well, there's a way to do this, but we've got to actually go and take a look in Word. Unfortunately, Excel doesn't have the option for storing group templates for a network folder. But in Word's version of the dialog, also found under the file options, if you go to advanced, and you go and click on the scroll bar and go down four big jumps, one, two, three, four, you'll find the general section. And under general, you'll see file locations. Notice that you can set up a user templates folder, and you can also set up a work group templates folder. This is an appropriate place to store your templates on a network drive so that your users, whoever configures their file path the same, will have access to all of those templates under that personal setting, just like in Excel. One key to be aware of though, you're also going to get Word templates and any other templates you create for other Office documents there as well. 
For our final task in this module, we're going to go and use some nice tabular data and we're going to build a mail merge off of this. The process we're replicating now is we've sourced some data from somewhere, we've cleaned it up, we've got it all ready, and we've got all these overdue balances. We want to send people dunning letters to hopefully inspire them to send us their money rather than hold on to that themselves. Now, before I actually go and set this up for my mail merge, I'm going to do one final preparation for my data here. I'm going to turn it into a table. This is not actually entirely necessary for the job, but because tables are so amazing, we want to use this anyway. The other thing that you should recognize here is Power Query, when you use it to clean up data and get that refreshable capability to it, it lands data into a table by default. The only secret to this, make sure your table lands in the first row of the worksheet in order to make this work. Now I'm just going to go give this a nice name, call it something like receivables, and now we're going to go and quickly save a copy of this file so that it's ready to work. And I'm going to go and throw this onto my desktop, and I think I'm going to call it S506 Overdue Customers dash complete. And now we're ready to kick over into Word to actually pull this in to a mail merge. So here we are in Word with our Dunning letter template. It's a standard form with a company name and address, the date, a place reserved for the customer name and address, dear so-and-so, and the message that your account is currently overdue. We want to put in the outstanding balance, how much has been outstanding, and how many days, and then remind them that they should be paying us because otherwise things could get nasty. So how do we make this work? Well, what we need to do first is we need to hook this up to a data set to replace the fields that we're working with. And what I do is go straight to the mailings tab. And rather than dealing with envelopes and labels and start mail merge, I'm just gonna go straight to this button to select recipients. We're gonna use an existing list, which comes from Excel, and we're gonna pick up from my desktop our overdue customers list, and we'll say open. Now you'll notice right now that it says sheet one, that's the name of the worksheet. So it doesn't actually really recognize our table. And that's why we had to have our table in the first row of the worksheet. It does give us the option though, to tell us that the first row contains column headers. And we want to make sure that that's selected as yes. We'll now say, okay. And at this point, the buttons here will all light up. Now, what I'd like to do first is I'd like to actually go and replace the customer name and address. And here's the thing, there's a field from our merge for an address block. And if I go and click that, you'll notice that it gives me this formula. It says, hey, do you want to put in like Joshua Rand or Joshua Randall Jr.? Now, this is not data from my data set, but this is. So how did it get all that right? Well, because our column names match what are normally used, it's actually picked those up for us. And you'll notice that by going into match fields, if there is anything that doesn't align quite properly, I can obviously go and change it. For example, if we had a company name that wasn't picked up, we could come in and we could actually map the field to that particular setup as well. For right now, everything looks like it's pretty perfect, including province that got mapped to the state field. So it's all good. What we're going to do is we're going to click OK, and we're going to say OK. And you'll notice that it puts in an address block surrounded by these little brackets. But unfortunately, it didn't replace all of this information. So I'm just going to go and press delete to get rid of it. Now, the next piece I want is dear first name. Well, I'm going to go now and insert a merge field specifically rather than an entire address block. So we'll go insert merge field and we'll choose first name. And it puts it within its brackets. I'm now going to choose my outstanding balance. Insert merge field, and we'll go with total balance. And this starts to really underscore why it's important to actually have good column names before you start doing this kind of work. And remember, Power Query, if you need it, will allow you to do that. So we'll now say that our overdue has been outstanding for X number of days. And at this point, our letter is now mapped to what's actually in that Excel document. So how do we actually go and find out whether or not it's working? Well, we can click preview results. And at this point, we get a letter that shows us that Casey has an overdue account. Oh boy, but the number format, that's pretty ugly. I'm not real happy with that. I need to fix this. 
So let's see how we're going to do this. The secret is to right click on the field and go and say toggle field codes. That's going to kick us into the merge field code this language that's actually used behind the scenes. And in order to control the number formatting, right before this final curly brace here, we're going to type in backslash pound space. Now we have to decide what our number format should be. The easiest way to figure that out is to go back to Excel. Do you remember using custom number formats? Let's go take a look at one now. We'll right click, we'll go to format cells, and we're going to choose a number format with a negative sign and two decimal places. Now this is already set based on this particular standard here. I think I'm going to also add thousand separators to it. And now I'm going to go to custom and guess what? Here's the number format that I need for word. So I'm going to copy that and say, okay. And now I'm going to jump back over to word and here we go. So we can just take that number format and right click and paste it right in here. Word uses the same number formats as Excel. And if I like, I can even copy this because I'm going to use it again. Now, now that I've actually put this in, let's right click and we'll go back, toggle the field codes off and nothing seems to have changed. Now, normally what happens is when you print, all of these fields are updated, but we can manually update the actual field as well to show that the format is working. Plainly, we need to do the same thing over here. So we'll toggle field codes right before the curly brace. I will paste in the code that I've actually used with the backslash hashtag and then hash comma hash hash zero dot zero zero. Right click, toggle the field code, right click and update again, and we're good to go. The 79 days I'm happy with, Casey and the address I'm happy with as well. So how do I check now that everything's working? It seems like it's okay. I can actually go and scroll through my different recipients and see that my letters are looking pretty nice actually. I'm really happy with this. So I scroll through and take a look. Oh no, I've come up against somebody here who has an outstanding balance, but there's actually no portion of it that's overdue. So this is a challenge that I need to deal with as well. I've now got records in here who shouldn't be sent their Dunning letters at all. And the last thing we want to do is, is go and upset a customer by sending them something early. So what we need to do is we need to go and we need to modify our data set to avoid bringing in customers who have balances that have been outstanding for zero days. Not a big deal. What we'll do is we'll come back over here and we'll edit the recipient list. Notice that we have a resizable dialog so we can see lots of stuff and we can actually open up the individual pieces here. It shows us where our data source is coming from and some different pieces, last name, first name, street address, and whatnot. I'm going to scroll across to the right hand side here and I'm going to look at my number of days overdue and there's a filter on it. So I'll click on this and I'm going to go to advanced. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't pick up the advanced field for me but I can change this and say, hey, let's go grab days overdue. And I wanna make sure that this is greater than zero. And when I say okay now, what we should see is that the address here from Snaketown, Yukon should disappear along with this other one from Burnt Hill, Manitoba. When we say okay, at this point, our total days overdue listing is all in good shape. So this is kind of nice because I can actually have a data set that still has those values in. I don't need to filter them out in Excel. And now when I say, okay, those items are going to be gone. So what happens next? Everything looks good. I can go and scroll through my different recipients here. I can see that everything looks nice. I'm now ready to go and actually do the merge itself. Now there's a couple of things that I highly recommend you do at this point. What I would do is I would save this document. This is the unmerged document and it'll let you come back here later. The other thing that I do is I don't click the finish and merge button. What I'll do is I'll say edit individual documents. This is going to create a new document that is the result of all of the merge fields. So when I say okay, you'll see that it's gonna create all of the different letters. So I can now scroll down through my list and see what each one of them looks like. This is a new Word document that's not linked to any fields, which means that I can save this and keep a historical record of the letters that I'm gonna send out. 
So I never use the ability to merge directly into email or directly to a printer. I always go create my document first and then go save that and print it later. This way I manage to keep a copy of the original document with the merge fields in, which will prompt me to update the data source when I go and open that up. And I also have my historical record. The cool thing about that, I can update my data source using Power Query, using regular Excel techniques, whatever it is, save it, open up the original Word document and reprint it. So next month I can reuse the same system.